Um, my world is the world of diaspora. There's an interesting link, I think, to that great story from, from Derry in that I worked for many years with the Ireland Funds and we worked with a lot of projects in Derry, Pauline Ross and Paddy Doherty, or Paddy Bogside as we used to call him, who kind of single-handedly rebuilt Derry and he has this terrific slideshow showing Derry sort of like 25, 30 years ago and, and wh how it is after he and his team got together and it really is the most compelling and convincing uh, show and I'm sure you've seen it many times and it's really great. I'm a fan, I'll speak quickly if you listen quickly because uh, time is restricted, but I, I'm a fan of um, a woman called Anne-Marie Slaughter who worked for the Obama administration in the State Department for, mm. for a few years and she wrote some interesting stuff. She said, we live now in the networked world. The information age is over. All information is available to everybody at the click of a switch. You can get open source information from everybody. But now we're in the networked world. Um, and we've replaced the vertical world of hierarchies with the horizontal world of networks. In this world, the measurement of power is connectedness. And collaboration was a word we just heard uh, a few minutes ago. It's a theme of this conference. Uh, she gave an interesting example. She said, the world is not about countries anymore. It's about cities. It's about connected clusters of creative people. She said, Palo Alto in California is more in common with Dubai, Shanghai, Bangalore, uh, Sydney, London, Paris, Dublin, than it does with Fresno which is two hours up the road. Its road system is broken, its education system is broken. So it's not about countries, it's about cities and regions. But she said that in this world, as I said, the measurement of power is connectedness. It's a world, not what you know, not even who you know, but who knows you as a person, an organization, and as a city. Um, she said that uh, um, now it's where you are from, means where you can and do go back and who people connect with and who people trust. And trust is that word that we've lost so much in business and trust is not an event, trust is not even deserved, trust is something that is earned. And so she's talking about people and countries, diasporas. And diaspora, which, you know, until about 10 years ago, I think most people thought diaspora was something you took two of with a headache. It was not a particularly well-known phrase, but now, people and countries are realizing. What was once the preserve of four countries, Israel, India, China, and Ireland, is now there's 150 countries trying to figure out how do they connect with what I call their diaspora capital. And diaspora capital is the overseas resources that is available to a country, a city, a place, an organization, and is made up of people and networks and ideas and opinions and concern for your country of origin country of ancestry, our country of affinity. We now live in a city which is 25% of this city not, were not born in Ireland. 17% of our total population not born in Ireland. Only 12% of the United States population not born in the United States. So this is an incredibly diverse society. So there are 232 million people in the world who live in a country other than the one they were born in. That's tripled in 30 years. Remittances this year, according to the World Bank, would be 540 billion US dollars. Remittance is the money people send back home to their country of origin or heritage or affinity. Um, that's a massive amount of money. That's what, what, what went through the banking system. Hundreds of millions more goes in more informal ways. The most sophisticated electronic transfer of country in the world is not the United States or Britain or Australia, it's Kenya with a system called M-Pesa. And remittances have tripled in 20 years. When I was growing up, money flows shifting around the world were 80% official development aid, ODA, and 20% private. They're now 90% private and 10% government. It's a fundamental shift in the relationship. And so we now see all these countries around the world trying to figure out how do they connect? How do they connect with their diasporas? And the interesting thing that people often forget is that diaspora is not about country. It's about place. And a place could be a region, a town, a city, a village. It could be an organization. American universities are very, very good at collecting with their alumni. Harvard has 800 people in their fundraising staff. They call it, um, they call it relations um, with their alumni, alumni relations. Yeah. Universities have alumni. Countries have diaspora. Swap them. Universities have diaspora countries have alumni. So you have opportunities to develop relationships and those relationships are just not purely about remittances, but they're about philanthropy, they're about trade and investment, they're about culture, 
they're about sport, they're about education, they're about tourism, they're about medicine. Medical tourism is an ex exploding industry at the moment. And so this is a fascinating space, and I've used up a lot of my time talking about it. I now am involved with another organization which has a diaspora dimension to it, but it's a commercial organization. It's in the field of crowdfunding. Crowdfunding globally is a $5 billion a year industry. And there is an organization in Ireland called Funded who do it for the cultural section. And I, with some friends, set up a company called Linked Finance to do it for small businesses. Because we wanted to find a mechanism to get money into small businesses in local situations. There's 96 billion in Irish banks. Irish banks won't lend to SMEs. And if they do lend, they'll charge exorbitant rates. So how do you get money in flowing into the SME section? Well, we're using this system called crowdfunding. We launched four months ago, and the population, the public, have already put a million dollars on this site, and we've funded 36 projects. And this is the way it works. The butcher in Tralee wants to buy a new mincing machine. The bank won't lend him the money. So he went to us, this is a real example. And we said, go to 400 of your customers and get 50 euro or 100 euro from each, which he did. And he now has 400 people walking around Tralee who say, that's my butcher. And you know where I'm gonna go and buy my meat? From my butcher. And my butcher is repaying every month what is installments on that loan. And what he says is, Mr. Smith, you're one of my lenders. And next Tuesday, there's 10% off lamb chops if you come into my, your store. And so I think crowdfunding has extraordinary potential because it's back to the old days of the co-op, where Ireland led the world in co-ops. And not far from here was St. Patrick's Cathedral, it was Jonathan Swift who first introduced the world's first crowdfunding initiative centuries and centuries ago. So I'm gonna show a quick two minute video just to liven up the afternoon and keep you awake after that lunch. Um, which explains this, and I can also take some questions and answers later in the day. So, Martin, I think, is going to run the video.